Hi everyone in cloud computing and welcome to episode 60 of the Cloud Computing Australia show which is also featured on YouTube and podcast with Brad Nelson and internationally recognized and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. This week we're excited to have Mark Thiel on our show as our special guest. Mark's successful career in IT spans 30 years and he's focused on both operating roles and on driving IT innovation efficiency and cloud adoption across enterprises of all sizes. Prior to joining Ericsson, Mark was the CIO and Chief Strategy Officer at Appsera, which was actually acquired by Ericsson. Mark is also the president and founder of Data Center Pulse, an organization created to promote best practices in the data center industry. Mark speaks globally at leading industry events on topics like cloud adoption, data center, IT organization, edge computing, and much more. Hi, Mark. It's great to have you on the Australia show this week, and thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Hi, Brad. Really happy to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you, Mark. It really is, and, and we fully appreciate your time this week on the, your Sunday afternoon. And hi, Dave. As always, a great to have you part of the Australia show. Yeah, it's always great to be here. Great having Mark here. Yeah, absolutely. Look, a warm welcome to both of you. In this week's show, we will be talking about 5G networks and edge computing, as Intel have announced that it will be providing technology to the internet service provider Rakuten for a cloud-native network. So guys, I mean, an opening question then, is the edge needed to augment 5G capabilities in Australia for cloud computing? I think this uh, is over to you then first, Dave. Yeah, this is kind of a cool story because we talked a bit about 5G's kind of um, influence on cloud computing and how it's gonna, you know, kind of change the game. We can actually get broadband access to places we couldn't get broadband access to before, before and that's really kind of needed for cloud computing. Edge computing, I'd love to hear Mark's take on this because he's an expert in the field, you know, is really about the ability to kind of, um, you know, put the compute power closer to where people are leveraging it. And I think that that's going to be a big part of 5G because for a couple of reasons, you know, number one, bandwidth is going to cost money. We're going to have to pay a, a, a fee for the data we use. Um, number two, is ultimately I think that we're going to have the, uh, the the capabilities in the edge that in many cases the cloud doesn't need to be bothered. And so why will use the cloud? I'm going through this right now in an edge-based uh, cloud computing project. Why the cloud is storing the long-term data you know that we're using for you know big data analytics. You know ultimately the edge can uh, basically do as many as 95% of the processing. So I, I think it's good we're thinking this way as 5G runs out. So what do you think, Mark? I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Yeah. I, I I totally agree with pretty much everything you said. Um, to me, uh, you know, 5G is one of the linchpins to helping to develop what I like to refer to as the edge marketplace. Um, there are obviously any number of uh, edge capabilities available today that have been available in some form for 20 plus years, including what uh, most people are, are most comfortable with, uh, like Akamai's uh, CDN service, right? That is an edge service, as it were. The way you use your phone and the applications that work effectively on your phone today, wherever you happen to be, when they work effectively in that location is edge for you at the time. 5G changes that dynamic significantly though. I mean, the ability to get, um, to do things that prior to 3G, um, the things that, for instance, in 2G, you never would have thought that video would become the biggest thing to use on your phones. Nobody would even have considered it. And 4G enabled that as an opportunity. 5G will be that enablement plus more. And the more is because not only will it offer greater um, capacity, and uh, but a much lower latency. And that lower latency will drive, in my mind, a tr significant number of new uh, opportunities for everyone in the business, not just those that would be obvious at the edge, like the Netflix or, um, uh, you know, a, a company like Uber or something like that, but virtually everyone to benefit from providing customers with a greater opportunity for a, a deeper experience at the edge um, and for uh, effectively finding ways to create more in intimacy with customers uh, through a greater um, involvement at the edge. I mean, if you think about uh, Nest, Right. Why did Google buy Nest? Was it because they needed thermostats and they thought that it'd be a good idea to get into the thermostat business? They bought Nest because it was another way to connect with customers at the edge in their homes to learn more about what they're doing. And, and whether it's Echo or 
Google Talk or, or Apple Home or whatever, all of those things are opportunities to get better access to the customer at the edge. And 5G will not only enable a vast number of new business models, but take, um, I think, initially entertainment and gaming and um, retail outlets especially uh, into a whole new uh, space of being able to stay connected with their customers and introduce them to experiences that uh, only something like 5G combined with some edge compute would be able to offer. So I'm uh, looking at my Nest device, my Echo right now. I think I should put them in a box <laughs> of water. Um, yes. So, yeah, so going forward, you know, if we're looking at kind of the 5G capabilities and its ability to kind of enhance the market, I kind of key in on that. Um, won't broadband, in essence, in many instances, eliminate the need to deal with edge-based devices since a lot of edge-based devices like I'm dealing with um, are very handy in low bandwidth situations, farm equipment, you know, remote access, things like that. And if I have a bigger pipe, you know, kind of back to the cloud, you know, I'm being devil's advocate here for what the opinions mm -hmm. we just don't have, you know, will I have less of a need for the edge-based devices? Yeah, I, I think that um, there's a couple of dynamics, a handful of dynamics at least that apply there, David. Um, uh, the first one is that there are many things that we do uh, relative to applications that people use today that are um, pragmatic decisions on design based on the capability of the network. Um, there are also pragmatic decisions based on cost is in the network, whether it's with the compute, whether it's the ability to support the compute, whether it's with the broadband backhaul or the, the slices of um, LTE or 5G network at the edge uh, or some combination of all of the above. And I think that while there are thousands of applications that work just fine today for how they function, there's a, a, a pull in my mind, there's a pull towards getting more value out of data in something approaching real time. And many of the applications that we use today that collect data at the edge are still not anywhere near approaching real time. Uh, and when you combine uh, real time not just real-time information, because real-time information is great. We've had that for years, frankly, in, if somebody wanted it. Uh, more often than not, it's the organization's ability to actually respond to it in real time that's important. Uh, and I think that that's changing because of things like cloud and digital transformation, getting enterprises to understand what working in real time actually means. But it's also that we, um, we're just literally just scratching the surface for the amount of data that will be generated at the edge and, and how it should be collected and how it should be used. Whether or not it's more efficient use of all of the data that comes in or more uh, just-in-time use of the 5% of the data that's of real value, the ability to do some of that at the edge and avoid round trips, avoid uh, backhaul latency, uh, backhaul bandwidth um, uh, requirements, and frankly, provide again provide a service to the customer that they otherwise um, wouldn't have been able to achieve. Uh, and and we mentioned Uber, or I mentioned Uber um, earlier on. And Uber is a great example. Lyft is another good example, um, where while you're looking at your phone, that application is constantly going back and communicating. Where's the car? Where's the car? Here's the car. Here's the car. Where's the car? Here's the car. Drivers available. Drivers not available. I've got to find a new driver. And the person holding the phone looking at the app expects the app to be telling them in real time effectively all of that stuff and if that communication had to occur across a 60 or in many cases 150 millisecond round trip link uh, link time to a, a primary public cloud location which is somewhere between 60 and 160 milliseconds is rough round trip for cloud access in the 48 contiguous states in north america i would imagine australia wouldn't be that different um that that's that can become a real problem for a chatty application like that. Yeah. So ultimately, um, so we get more edge devices for the systems like that. We become a little bit more better at uh, you know dealing with the architecture. Doesn't this kind of lead to a management challenge? Because I have the back end to manage that exists on the cloud based systems, but I have you know thousands of edge devices that I have to manage and replace and you know upgrade and you know, do all those things that happen when you have any sort of computer system and edge at the end of the day, they're very cheap yeah. about their computer systems. Yeah, well, I, you know, as um, Brad indicated in my um, 
the opening bio for me. Uh, even though I love the kind of conversations that we're having right now, um, uh, I can't deny my operational background. And so when I think of edge computing, I think of uh, I'm reading some things into what you just said, but I'm thinking about how do we install it? How do we keep it updated? How do we replace it? How do we upgrade it? Um, how do we uh, keep it secure? All of those things fall into the category of, okay, I'm sure someone could do all that stuff, but could they do it in a way that makes it cost effective to actually provide applications via that platform? And that's the real question, right? We could, like sending a man to the moon or a woman to the moon for that matter, we can do it when cost is not an issue. It doesn't make any difference. You just find the right answer and you make it happen. Well, edge computing will happen in my mind when the barriers to entry make it easy for the vast majority of applications that are likely to be pennies a person type of applications to be successful at deployment to the edge, similar to the way one of us could deploy an app on uh, on Apple's uh, iStore, Apple's uh, App Store, in a matter of minutes and have it available to you know 1.5 billion people. The edge marketplace has to get to something similar to that. So what that means in the way of our ability to provide um, some of the most effective operational ownership strategies for the equipment at the edge, uh, and even uh, ownership strategies that haven't been considered yet, things that even Google wouldn't be doing in a, um, in a campus environment, things like uh, literally um, uh, replacing whole units and, and, and uh, just replacing them when uh, a certain percentage of capacity is broken and just replace the whole, the whole unit again and just leave it there. Don't ever assume that someone will be going to the site. For bigger sites, uh, thinking about things like having a delivery, a local delivery service or a national delivery service become your certified mechanic, as it were, as opposed to a true um, technician. And that mechanic would go out and put uh, hard disk drives or new CPUs or motherboards into a robotic device that would replace and update hardware. Having all of the ability to replace everything from firmware up through um, patching on the OS, even up, uh, uh, OS upgrades, um, doing all of that remotely and have that be part of your security regimen and part of your application maintenance regimen as well. Um, uh, those things and more, I mean, how, how we keep and, and remove storage. When do we make decisions on whether the storage stays at the edge, gets deleted, and, and how do we guarantee it's deleted or sent back to core clouds somewhere? Um, uh, the bottom line is, to your question, there are a lot of hurdles still to occur. Um, there are, uh, you know, many companies that have led the way in helping to build um, very specific, narrow-focused edge solutions like Netflix, like Uber, uh, and like others that can be models for some. But I think if I were to read a little bit more into your question and say, you know, what's the likelihood that some individual company can provide pervasive um, edge computing that hangs off every lamppost, is in every central office, in every populated part of every country, uh, and do that quickly and have a management plan for it. Uh, I think that that's fallacy. I think you know we're going to have to do some trial and error, just like we did in the early days of um, of building for the internet. Uh, and I, you know, I I like to before I get off my high horse, I like to reference uh, Google or Facebook, Yahoo. Again, same sort of thing is that. When you think about barriers to entry, um, for people who use Google or Facebook, they think, yeah, they made it work. They make a lot of money off of it. And they did. But if we were to go back to Google in, say, 2003, 2004, and instead of putting things like Borg together um, and moving from managing 500 machines to 5,000 machines to 50,000 machines per person, if they had continued building the way they were building in 2002 or 2003, they wouldn't be making enough money to pay their technicians today, right? And so the edge has to go through some of that same hurdle uh, before it can really be populated and, and be cost effective. Good response. <clears throat> so going forward, where are we uh, where are we going to be in five years with this technology? We're looking at this deal and the other ones that are out there. And so, um, you know, is this going to be um, – just kind of baked in a lot of our devices, very much like some of the edge stuff I'm dealing with right now. And, you know, or is this going to be specialized technology? Are we going to get really good bandwidth at the 
you know, cloud-based systems are going to push the edge computers closer to the cloud? Are they going to be pushed closer to the consumer? Um, you know, put your time uh, time machine on. Uh, you know, where are we going to be in five years? Yeah, I, I don't I don't know that um, the average consumer will notice how they own technology changing significantly in five years. Um, what I think the average consumer will notice is that they've begun to grow accustomed to being able to walk around a neighborhood um, and have an AR application on their phone tell them what movies are playing in real time uh, at the movie theater they happen to be going past or even potentially driving past the movie theater and have their phone be able to tell them in real time before they're three blocks away from the movie theater. Um, I believe we'll see things out of events from a replication of the event in real time to um, to 3D rendering of events in real time to people being able to, to actually post um, live video and Instagram in real time at an event versus waiting until the event's over because they couldn't find bandwidth while they were at the football game or at the um, concert. Because today, frankly, I mean, I, every time I ask this question of someone, uh, I shouldn't say every time, nine out of 10 times, when I say, were you able to easily post an Instagram photo or a video while you were at the ball game? The, the common answer is no. The bandwidth is horrible. It takes forever. Um, and already ballparks are looking at how do they display real time video, even just on both sides of the stadium. And things like 5G will help do that so that somebody watching from the clubhouse, watching the video on the other side of the, um, of the football pitch, will see in real time that goal occur just as the people watching the goal on the field will see it. Uh, and 5G and capabilities like that are key. And, and then uh, I think we'll, we'll, in five years, we'll have begun to see what um, the environment around us being a lot smarter means to our day-to-day -day lives. And we see that to some degree you know, in our homes with things like Nest, et cetera. Uh, or if you're dri certainly if you're driving around a modern car, if you're getting into an Uber and it knows what music you were playing on your iPhone, uh, or you get into your Tesla and it and it continues playing your music, or finds your radio station or news station, whatever it is you were listening to, um, I think we'll see more and more of that. But I think even in the in the home and in the office, um, uh, and and when you're in cities, um, the environment around you in five years will be considerably more alive and interactive than it is today. Yeah, I can't disagree with any of that. Brad, do you have any comments? Oh, well, I, I don't know where to start, really. Uh, Mark, that's been fantastic. Both of you, listening to both of you, it's, um, it's exciting times, but also, I think, a daunting time because there's a huge amount of potential vulnerabilities that open up with the convenience of 5G and being so connected and having so many uh, edge devices that are feeding back everything very personally to a bigger organization that's holding that data and storing that data that we don't know how long that data is going to be stored for, what it potentially could be used for or sold for. So, yeah, I mean, it's exciting times. I mean, that's really my only comments. And you guys have covered so much, which has been fantastic and very fascinating to listen to. Um, we're coming to the end of the show, unfortunately, uh, although we're looking forward to the C-Suite show and the training show we've still got to record. So most definitely looking forward to those. So thank you both for your time. But I mean, David, we normally end the show on your on your three top tips. So um, can you summarize those uh, in, a, in a timely fashion, do you think? <laughs> oh, sure. I'll rush right through them. Uh, number one, 5G won't save you, so keep that in mind. So ultimately, this is a bandwidth issue. This is pervasive uh, information down to people that uh, typically, down to people in devices that typically wouldn't have that sort of bandwidth. And ultimately, if you're waiting for bandwidth to become better at, you know, um, getting around chatty applications, things like that, bad designs, bad designs. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Keep the end game in mind as all this is kind of coming forward. So we move things down to the edge because it makes sense to do so. We move things to the back end systems as it makes sense to do so. And we have to do so with a purposeful, purposeful uh, you know, kind of bent as to what, how it's going to affect the business. And finally, watch uh, what you place on the edge. I mean, one of the big mistakes I think a lot of my clients made is doing way too much on the edge or doing way too little on the edge. So it doesn't cost justify the computers or it saturates the computers, or really doesn't balance the bandwidth issues, which you're really looking to solve with edge-based computing. So a little architecture goes a long way. Great top tips there, Dave. Thank you very much. And uh, Mark, 
thank you for being part of the Australia show this week. It's been great to have you on. Oh, it was a pleasure. It was good fun. Thank you for having me. Uh, to both of you, to David and Brad, thank you. You're more than welcome. And Dave, as always, thank you for being part of the Australia show. It's great to be here. Excellent. And thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, you can get us all on Twitter as well. So I'll post the links below. But Mark's on Twitter, which is amthiel, mthiel10. Sorry, mthiel10. I'll get that right. David's on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum. I'm on Twitter at Nelson underscore Hilliard. We're on Instagram, Facebook, all the social media channels. So check those out. We've got some great blogs as well. All the links are in the description box, as I've already said. Thanks for watching. And until next week. <laughs>